This video is for educational and infotainment purposes only. It is not intended to encourage or glorify criminal activity in any way. So Al Capone, Scarface, is generally considered the father of money laundering in the United States and who in his prime washed an estimated $100 million a year. That is $1.5 billion in today's dollars, a crazy amount of money. Capone did this through several cash-only investments and businesses, including laundromats, which is where the name comes from, at least in part. Now, Scarface wasn't the first guy to launder money. Hell, there are stories in the Bible about people who were hiding the source of ill-gotten gains and effectively laundering currency. But Capone's activities were on such a broad scale that it brought the subject matter front and center to law enforcement in the United States. And it started the back and forth between the lawmakers and the criminals and their ingenuity that has colored the landscape of money laundering over the past 100 years. So money laundering, what is it and how do you do it? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we are talking about money laundering. If you have seen my earlier video on the topic, then you're already familiar with the basic concepts and examples of money laundering. If you haven't seen it, no worries. We're gonna cover all of that in today's video as well. Also in this video, we will define money laundering. We'll talk about how it's done conceptually through the placement, integration, and layering of funds. We're gonna go through several examples of money laundering, both real and fictional, including an in-depth look at how Marty Bird of the Netflix series Ozark used a casino to launder money right under the Fed's noses. We're going to talk about the laws that have been established over the years to combat money laundering. Finally, we're going to talk about the most interesting money laundering case that I have handled. It was a week-long jury trial of a meth distribution and money laundering ring in southwest Missouri, and it's still the most sophisticated criminal scheme I have ever seen in 25 years of practicing law. So you're going to want to stick around to hear that story. All that and more in today's episode. If you enjoy the episode or you learned something, hit that like button for me. If you got a question, a comment, something to say, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button. And you guys know it. I love it when you share me on social media. And as most of you know, Lawyer Up has partnered with Webull, the online broker that allows you to buy and sell stocks or crypto or whatever you are into directly from your computer or the mobile app on your phone. Webull is free to join. It's free to use. There is no cost to buy or sell, so it's commission-free trading. Better yet, when you sign up, link a bank account, and deposit as little as one cent, Webull will give you at least two free stocks worth at least $3 per share. So it's free money as well. So if you would like to join the over 2 million Webull traders, all you have to do is click on the link in the description below this video to sign up. Happy trading. So money laundering, what is it? Let's talk about the definition. Now money, obviously you know what that is, that's currency. Laundering, just in general, is to clean something that is dirty. Think of a shirt, you get something on it, you launder your shirt. So money laundering is simply the act of taking money that was obtained by illegal means, dirty, and making it appear that it has been acquired by legal means, clean. Today, it is illegal to launder money in both the United States and internationally, but as you will learn in this video, it hasn't always been that way. Now, why would someone need to do this? Well, there's a variety of reasons that you'll learn in this video, but the most basic reason is that if you are wealthy, 
people are going to wonder how you acquired your wealth. And the government is going to be curious. And it is generally frowned upon if you're at a dinner party to say, yeah, I'm involved in organized crime. We traffic narcotics and arms and humans. So there's a need to articulate a legitimate source of income to cover up the illegal activities. And it really is that simple. So who does this? Well, it's very popular, obviously, with criminals, organized crime. You've got your drug trafficking, arms trafficking, illegal gambling, prostitution, extortion rackets, cigarette and alcohol smuggling. Those are common examples of areas where people need to launder money. But it can be relevant to money made from any illegal activity. We just had a group indicted here in Southwest Missouri that was stealing and selling tens of thousands of catalytic converters behind the facade of an automotive parts distribution company. So that is how they laundered their money. So money laundering can be and is relevant in any type of criminal enterprise. Also, the methods that are used are innumerable, and they're only limited by criminal ingenuity. And we will talk about several of the popular methods throughout this video. Money laundering is a federal law that makes it illegal to conceal or disguise the source, ownership, or control of monetary proceeds that were gained from unlawful activities or it is to avoid banking transaction reporting requirements, that's called structuring, and we will talk about that as well in this video. The offense carries punishment from zero to 20 years in the Bureau of Prisons, and the fine is twice the amount of the money laundered or half a million dollars, whichever is greater. So the minimum fine that can be assessed is half a million dollars. You also forfeit any and all monies that was actually laundered. As an attorney, I've handled dozens of cases that involved money laundering. And as I mentioned in a little while, we're going to talk about my favorite laundering case that went to a trial in federal court a few years ago. Interestingly, in my 25 years of practicing law, I have never seen money laundering charged in isolation or by itself. There are always other counts charged in addition, and usually it's in connection with whatever other illegal activities generated those laundered funds. Now, when we talk about the methodology generally, it's a three-step process to clean dirty cash. Number one is the placement, where you introduce or you place the dirty cash into a legitimate financial system. Number two is the layering. That's the mixing or the commingling of the dirty money with the clean money in a legitimate financial transaction that camouflages those illegal funds. Finally, we have the third step, which is integration. And that's where dirty money appears to have been earned by a legitimate source and is now clean and can be used for any purpose. When I was in law school, our criminal professor described this using a jelly bean analogy. It's a little weird, but it makes it kind of clear in the mind. So let's say I steal a handful of jelly beans. They have been illegally acquired. And then I open and I put them in a big jar of jelly beans. Now that is the placement. I take the jelly beans, I shake them up, mix them all together. That's the layering of the stolen jelly beans. And then at the end, I open up the top, you walk into the room and you get your jelly bean out. You have no clue that there are even stolen jelly beans in the jar of jelly beans. So that's the integration. Now, it's admittedly a little bit of a weird example to explain money laundering with jelly beans. But hell, I remember it 25 years later. But let's move on to a more concrete example. Let's talk about the Netflix series Ozark, where the whole series and the lead character launders money for a Mexican drug cartel. To do so, Marty Bird buys various businesses to launder money through, including a strip club, a restaurant lodge and marina, which he renovates, and then ultimately riverboat casinos. To illustrate the process, let's look at what Marty Bird did with the casinos. So for those of you familiar with casinos, there are table games. And within those tables, there are locked cash boxes that casino dealers place money and chips in. So at the start of the day, these boxes are empty and they fill up as customers gamble. 
However, Marty Bird added a few thousand dollars of cartel drug money into each cash box at the start of the day when they were still away in the cash room. That was the placement of those illegal funds. Now, those boxes are locked, so the dealers really have no idea what's in them, and nobody on the floor knows exactly how much money is going into each box during the course of the day. Dealers rotate, they take breaks, they take shifts. So money is added to these boxes as customers gamble. And this is the layering of the clean money that gamblers are putting in there and the dirty money that had already been put in there from the drug cartel. At the end of the day, the cash is all counted back in the cash room. It's all treated as gross income for the casino, and that is the integration. And that is just one example of how to launder money. Now that we understand the basic concepts of how to launder money, let's go back and look at the history of money laundering and discuss the evolution of laundering techniques in response to the government's attempts to thwart it through legislation. Now, money laundering rose to prominence during the Prohibition era in the 20s and 30s, in particular in regard to organized crime. Alcohol was illegal and these speakeasies were popping up all over the place. These were bars that sold alcohol and drugs and prostitutes, had illegal gambling, and most of them were involved in extortion as well. Their popularity fueled organized crime during this time period. And no one was more popular at that time than Al Capone, Scarface, and his Chicago crime syndicate. He really controlled the bootleg liquor supply for these speakeasies all throughout the Midwest. His famous quote was, I'm just giving the people what they want. And boy, was he. But if you know your history, Capone didn't get busted for organized crime. He didn't get busted for the St. Valentine's Day massacre of rival gang members in a fake police raid. He didn't get busted for killing three of his own men with a baseball bat after he found out that they double-crossed him. He got busted and sent to Alcatraz for tax evasion. But the money itself, it was a ghost. The government couldn't track it and they couldn't seize it. By establishing several elaborate money laundering businesses, Al Capone had provided the playbook for criminal organizations to follow to scrub dirty cash. And by the way, if you are interested in the full history of Al Capone from birth to death, check out that video on my channel. It's super interesting. So for the next 30 years, organized crime continued to grow and so did the business of money laundering and they used plenty of traditional means, restaurants, bars, casinos, but the really big crime syndicates just started using banks. They bought banks. And people say, well, you can't just buy a bank. Well, you can if you have enough money. And it became a big enough problem within the organized crime world that in 1970, the Bank Secrecy Act was passed. And that permanently changed the landscape of money laundering in the United States forever. Now, the act of money laundering wasn't criminal yet. That wouldn't happen for another 15 years. But make no mistake about it, this was a direct attack on organized criminals and their attempts to hide money. Now, the two big aspects of the Bank Secrecy Act were, number one, know your customer laws, and number two, the currency transaction reporting requirements. So let's start with know your customer laws. This required banks to engage in due diligence to actually know who their customers were. So first of all, they had to be able to identify the customer. They had to obtain satisfactory identification, name, address, social security number, those types of things. For corporations, they had to get the corporate documents of the business, the state charter, bylaws, tax ID numbers, and the names of the owners. Now, offshore accounts in, say, Grand Cayman or Switzerland, those are places where accounts can be known by just a number only. Well, you couldn't do that in the U.S., not anymore, not after the Bank Secrecy Act. Number two, these banks had to know their customers' banking habits regarding deposits and withdrawals. For example, if Farmer Brown comes in every Friday and deposits $500, and he comes in this Friday and deposits $50,000, you might want to look into that. It might be legit, but it might not be. 
And today, with the way banking is done online and all over the place, it's impossible to really manually monitor what your customers are doing. So there is software that is designed to flag irregular deposits or withdrawals, and it alerts bank management to examine or look at that transaction. Banks are also required to maintain banking records regarding customer transactions for certain specified periods of time. And fourth, they're supposed to report suspicious activities, including large transactions. Now we move on to the CTR or the currency or cash transaction reports. Now that's not what they were originally called, but that's what we call them today. So banks and financial institutions have to report any cash deposit or withdrawal exceeding $10,000 in any 24-hour period. And 10,000 is the today's number. They have to identify the customer and the source of that cash. These days, these reports are created automatically by software at the bank and filed electronically with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network with the Department of Treasury for review. Now, there's nothing inherently illegal with depositing or withdrawing $10,000 in cash. But if the teller thinks that there is something that is off, they click the SAR box for a suspicious activity report, which triggers a formal investigation. So after this, the criminals were like, well, all right, if there's gonna be a $10,000 trigger, I'll just do deposits of $9,900, or I'll otherwise structure my deposits in such a way to avoid the CTR requirements. But remember the definition of money laundering. Not only is it to conceal or disguise the source, ownership, or control of proceeds from unlawful activities, it also includes avoiding transaction reporting requirements, and that's structuring. So purposely tailoring deposit behaviors to avoid these reporting requirements is illegal, and it is a form of money laundering. So this crackdown on U.S. banks caused money laundering to head overseas. Banks in Switzerland or Grand Cayman, they prided themselves on customer privacy. You've heard of Swiss bank accounts. You can set these up under any name. People often used shell corporations that weren't tied to any specific individual. All you really needed was the bank account number, the routing number, and then the owner code, and anybody could deposit or withdraw from these accounts. So by the mid-70s, criminal organizations were bailing out of U.S. banks, and they were headed overseas to avoid the new U.S. bank restrictions. Note that at this time, there was still no actual statute against money laundering. So money could be sent to a Swiss bank account without detection and come back laundered as a quote, you know, return on foreign investment or profit from a company in Europe or whatever. Then the 1980s war on drugs happened and the federal government stepped up law enforcement against organized crime and drug distribution rings, including in 1986, officially criminalizing money laundering in the United States. And even though the domestic drug enforcement was on the rise, offshore bank accounts were still king for money laundering. And that was until 9-11. Title III of the Patriot Act was a direct result of the 9-11 attacks when it was discovered that financing for these terrorist groups was the product of international money laundering. This was when the nation and the world really got serious about international money laundering. An International Financial Action Task Force was created and formed for the surveillance and monitoring of global financial transactions. And the goal, of course, was to combat international money laundering and terrorism financing. And so the United States convinced many of the foreign nations that had held privacy as king to take a more active role in customer due diligence. And in the United States, huge scrutiny was placed on international wire transfers of greater than $10,000, some of which would be held up for months while they were investigated. So after the Patriot Act, these offshore bank accounts lost their luster because they were being monitored so closely by the federal government. So money laundering simply came back home in the 2000s, and it has remained basically the same way up until today where people, criminal enterprises, just use business fronts, just like Al Capone did 
in the early 30s. What criminals are looking for are cash intensive businesses where most of the income is cash and where it's easy to mix in illegal money with legitimate money and claim it as legally earned business income. Most common businesses that you see are strip clubs or bars or restaurants, hotels, and casinos. Some of the newer businesses are tanning salons, car washes, arcades, parking lots, and parking garages. Now, service-oriented businesses are best. They are much better than a business that sells goods because it's harder to prove the number of services provided as opposed to a business that sells a specified number of an inventory. If you want to think about some of the popular TV shows over the last few years that featured money laundering, we have Breaking Bad. He had Gus Fring. He was a drug lord. He laundered money through the Los Polos Hermanos restaurant. Walter White, of course, the meth cook in Breaking Bad, laundered money with his wife Skyler by faking receipts through a car wash. The Netflix show Ozark, which we touched on earlier, a show specifically dedicated to laundering cartel money. Marty Bird used a strip club, a lake resort, which had a bar, restaurant, hotel, and marina, and riverboat casino. And we already talked about how they would lace the cash boxes with cash before they were put on the floor. But in that uh, show, they also resorted to just handing people money and paying them to lose it in the casino so they could claim that money as profits. In real life, most of the laundering cases that I have seen involved casinos, but people were laundering their money without the casino's knowledge. And what they generally do is they take the drug money that they've earned from selling drugs and they go into the casino, they get some chips, they play for a bit and then they cash out. So you get a check or a receipt for the money and you can just simply claim that as gambling winnings. Winning at a casino is legal and it's legitimate income if you pay taxes on it. And so that's how most small time crooks launder their money. But a lot of people get caught because they don't realize that casinos are financial institutions with a CTR reporting requirement as well. So if you move more than $10,000 in a day, the casino will be filing a report with the government. But the best money laundering scheme I have ever seen involved a case that I tried a few years ago. So in my world, the money laundering cases that I see are always in connection with money being cleaned for drug distribution rings. A few years ago, I had a week-long jury trial where the feds never caught my client buying, selling, or even possessing meth at any time, ever. But they did have solid evidence of another individual who was moving pounds and pounds of meth up from Mexico who would then sell it and purchase cars with the drug money that provided the inventory for my client's car lot that he would then sell legitimately, thereby washing the funds. And as an aside, this meth operation was really sophisticated as well. From Arizona, they would purchase the meth from the cartels in Mexico. Then they would double vacuum seal the packages. Then they inserted the sealed bags into metal canisters. From there, they filled the metal canisters with coffee beans and olive oil to disguise the scent from drug dogs. Then they welded these canisters shut and they put them into cars to smuggle them to Springfield, Missouri. But they didn't stop there. They put these cars that were loaded with meth up on a double-decker car hauler. They put the drug-loaded cars up high on the second story, the clean cars down below, because even if you get pulled over, you ain't getting a drug-sniffing dog way up there, and the officers aren't going to get up there and search through those cars either. So then they would transport these cars back to Springfield, Missouri, sell the drugs, buy more cars, sell more cars, launder more money. And they did this for several months, making over 50 grand a month in profits. And the DEA agents on the case actually told me that if someone in the chain hadn't been busted and rolled on the group, telling the DEA exactly when and where the cars would be coming to town that they might never have figured it out. But they did. They found the drugs. They followed the money, which led to a car lot that was owned by my client. So the feds used this relationship to tie my client back into the drug conspiracy case, which turned a 0 to 20 year money laundering case into a 10 to life drug conspiracy matter. 
So proving up a money laundering operation can be a central component in actually proving the underlying criminal activity that generated that dirty money. So when we talk about the newest, the trendiest forms of money laundering, one of the big areas is the art market. And if you think about it, of course, it's subjective. Who's to say that a certain painting isn't worth $30,000? And art isn't titled. There's no registration requirements. You really don't even have to know the buyer's name. You say, some guy came by, he liked my painting, he gave me 30 grand for it, I think his name was Jeff. I don't know. I don't have his address. I don't know his name. And if you pay taxes on that income, it's hard to prove otherwise. Also, cryptocurrency. We've got Bitcoin, for example. The blockchain technology that supports cryptocurrency claims to be completely transparent, when in fact a sophisticated trader that can engage in thousands and thousands of transactions can actually create a functionally anonymous currency that can be used for any purpose, legal or illegal. Online gaming has actually become a big area of money laundering. Second Life, World of Warcraft, or any game where you use actual money to purchase goods or powers, and then later you can cash them back out for money. This is the latest and greatest means by which criminals are laundering money. So when will the government strike back? When will they extend the know your customer laws to art houses or cryptocurrencies or online gaming? Well, we're just gonna have to wait and see. So that is the episode. I hope that you have enjoyed it. If you have, hit that like button. If you got something to say, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Smash that subscribe button. And as always, you guys know it. I love it when you share my videos on social media. My name is Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money.